You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the books Long Walk Up, Portia, Love Pour Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. Dream it, wish it, do it. That's a quote, quote we're kicking off today's show with dream it, wish it, do it. And that that is attributed to Anonymous. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, It takes more than just dreaming and hoping and believing. you got to put the right actions in order. And we have a guest on a day who could help us with that. And another thing I want to kick off this show, I wanna, I've want to. i celebrated this day for years but it's been made a federal holiday, and when I think back to my ancestors and what they went through, oh, my goodness, I can't even imagine living through so many decades of that. But happy Juneteenth, happy, blessed Juneteenth to those out there celebrating this. Just a, 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 I, I can only imagine what my ancestors felt like, but happy Juneteenth to you. And I want to tell you that you are listening to the Winning Book Radio Show off the shelf. And welcome to this Saturday, June 19th show. And we have a wonderful guest on deck for you. But before we introduce her to you, I keep asking you guys how good of a mystery sleuth are you. And if if you love mystery and you value relationships, and there's a complicated relationship between a father and a son in this book, and there's a soulmate relationship and these five guy friendships they meet in college in Pennsylvania. If you value relationships and how we influence each other and we help to actually shape and change each other. And when you think back to your childhood or going going way, way back, people think, oh, stuff that happened so long ago doesn't still have impact. It does. A lot of it impacts our policies and the way we, our, psych, our psychology, the way we think, our emotions. It, it does have impact, which is really important for us to love each other because it does have impact. And for, I mean, for who knows how long, of an impact when we love each other and make that choice that it will have on a person. But if you value, if you value relationships, I encourage you to get a copy of Love for Over Me today. You can get it in print or in ebook format. Enjoy, enjoy Love for Over Me. You can get it for three dollars and ninety nine cents if you get it in an ebook, and it's also in paperback. Go treat yourself. And now let us go and meet our very special off the shelf guest. And this morning's off the shelf guest is. Kim Stanwood, Terra Nova, and if I misspell, uh, pronounce her name, I hope she corrects me. Kim, is she the work she does, she does a good work. So the work she does is to help you remember who you really are as a powerful creative being. We come into this world, we're ready to go when we come here. And then di- different things happen, like people say, oh, that's so long ago. The stuff still impacts us. It really does, and I, re- I hope that one day we will... We will grasp that, so we'll do the good stuff now so it has long-term effects. So she helps you to remember who you really are as a powerful, creative being. You, we're in this world 10 years, and we already start to doubt ourselves. And Kim is a licensed practitioner of truth. For more than 25 years, she has worked as a counselor, a life coach, spiritual leader, and adding book author to that. She serves as a lead teacher at Rhythmia Life Advancement Center. She also works as a counselor at the Summit Treatment Center, and she is the founder of Namaste Retreats and has worked with uh, other life servants such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, Rhonda Britton, and Terry Cole Whitaker. She is the author of the book, The Technology of Intention, and we're going to bring her on live here on Off the Shelf. We want to welcome Give her a very warm welcome. Oh, before we do that, I want to remind you guys to check Kim out online. And her website is Kim Stanwood Terranova, and I'm going to spell it K I M S T A N W O O D T E R R A N O V A dot com. Kim Stanwood Terranova dot com. We're absolutely honored to have her with us on Off the Shelf this morning. Welcome to Off the Shelf, Kim. Oh, my goodness. What a greeting. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you for having me. Oh, no. We, we was, we're happy to have you on here. You know what? I've, we've been doing off the shelf now going on 16 years, 
And I every, I learned something from every single guest. When I first started, and I would come on just you know do the interview, hope to hope to give the author, the guest exposure for their works, whether it's a book or a movie that they're working on, something in the storytelling realm. And then I'm like, oh my goodness, every show I'm learning something. I'm learning <laughs> something from every guest. What a gift to do that. And the what first, a bonus and. Right, yeah, it's like a, we're we're all learning from each other. Thank goodness. Yeah, so it's like, and, and hopefully we're teaching good good lessons and not er, erroneous uh, lessons. But the first four to five questions I'm going to ask, I ask every guest. I can remember the early days when I started out. People told me you go right into the questions. Give us a little backstory on the guest. So the first four questions I ask every single guest who comes on the show. So to start, Kim, can you tell off-the-shelf listeners where you grew up and what life was like for you growing up? Oh, I love that question. I grew up in a very small town called Pinole. It's in the um, East Bay area of Northern California. And for me, growing up, in the town was so small, I describe it this way. I could ride my horse down the center of the street, ride through Jack in the Box, get my food, and get back to the barn, and I would not disrupt any traffic. It was that small. Wow. And it was a perfect place for me to grow up and learn about life because I got curious. I got very curious about everything outside of life. And I was having mystical experiences at a young age that I really wanted answers for. So it was a wonderful cocoon of safety of a real small town environment that just created space for me to grow and get curious and then launch out into the world later in life to ask big questions and understand more. It was perfect. You know what? It's interesting that you say that. We've had several guests come on. Some, uh, the town they grew up in was so small, they said they didn't have a, even have any, uh, like, traffic lights. And they were like, I got to get out of there. <laughs> and it was so small. But your approach was more of a, like, you were just appreciating that start to your this physical experience where you, but yeah, we Absolutely. had a couple of guests who came on. They said their town was so they're like when I tell you small, I mean it was small. So when you were when you were a kid, what did you what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, initially, I think I wanted to be, be a jockey because I was a horseback rider. Um, I wanted to, besides being a jockey, I knew there was something bigger I wanted to do to be in the world and understand it more. And I didn't know what that was. I couldn't put my finger on what it was. Besides in the world and really having a voice. And at the time, as I grew into, you know, teen years, in my mind, I thought, well, to have a voice in this world, you have to be in politics or the entertainment business. And I was not about to go into politics. So (laughs) I went towards the entertainment field and then realized, so became an actress right after college and soon realized I was portraying roles, though, that weren't in alignment with my spiritual belief because I was also expanding spiritually. And when, when that became out of alignment, that, oh, I'm portraying roles that don't express who I am as a being, then I realized my spiritual practice became the path of, that I went down that was the muscle I wanted to build and understand and speak from that platform versus I grew out of the, oh, no, it's not supposed to be through the entertainment field, which I love. It's supposed to be somewhere else where I'm speaking authentically me. Um, So it was a natural progression out of a small town to a bigger city to a bigger city. But the cocoon of the small town created safety for me to know I could grow. Wow. Interesting. You know, a lot of people go through life, Kim, and maybe it's something we explore later in the show as well. And I've met people who tell me, you know, people say, oh, it's, uh, if you do this or a certain time, you'll know exactly what you're in this earth for. And they're like, that's, mm. that's, that's hogwash. That's not true. But I said, yeah, I knew when I was 10 I was going to be a writer. Wow. It was revealed to me. But a lot of people say they, they, they go their whole life and they never know. They just, you just sort of bounce around to uh, different jobs. You can pay your rent mm-hmm. or you can pay your mortgage or if you live off the grid, whatever you have enough money to do that with, and you just bounce sure. around. And they, I've heard, I've heard people literally say, "I don't know what to do next," or something happens, and yeah. like I have no idea what to do with my life. It sounds like it just sort of opened up for you, uh, and for our listeners, uh, 
uh, who might themselves be in that space. How mm-hmm. did how did you get that clarity that you knew what to do next? How did you? Some people are uh, lost. They're like they don't know what to do. It, for me, the clarity came from deep, deep listening. So my confusion, so say <clears throat> the confusion I had in high school and college of just where am I going in life started to cause pain. I was in pain, which, you know, my teachers always said to me, you either get pulled by the pain or pushed by the vision. And I was pulled by the pain of, oh, I want so much more in life and to express so much. And I want to understand so much more in life that that pain pulled me to places to start to grow. I started to read everything. I started to get curious. And when my intention, at a very young age, I started to work with intention, and my intention was to get clarity. And when I started knowing my intention is to gain crystal clear clarity on the path before me, well, the universe is going to respond to us at any point. So that clarity came in time, and I, I believe that I know this is possible for every single one of us. When we hold the space, that I'm calling forth clarity and then listening to that inner voice within and cultivating a true deep place of listening to spirit, to source, to ourselves, whatever we wish to name it, that listening will lead us into the next step we're supposed to go. It will be a spark. Something will lead us down the path of, oh, I'm supposed to be right here. And all of our next steps and next steps will be revealed when we really cultivate listening. You know what, this is something I think that would benefit a lot of people, and some people try to do this. If we heard from our true inner self and we knew that's where it was coming mm-hmm. from, I think a lot mm-hmm. of us just immediately feel so much peace. The The conflict in the world would be reduced significantly. Oh, and I think yes, a lot of yes. people are just doing what they think they need to do to pay the bills. So to to, to, yes. to get to that place of this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing right now in this world mm-hmm. would, would would be very freeing for a lot of people. So I wanted to ask you next, why why a spiritual practice? And how old were you when you were drawn down this path? You said you were the pain, mm-hmm. you were pulled to it. Were you r- real, real young? Were you older when you were drawn down this path? And what were those early spiritual practices like for you? Was it meditating? Mm-hmm. Was it hiking? What were those early spiritual mm-hmm. practices like? I was in, I would say, in high, late high school, early into college, I was feeling very confused. So the pain, and I think that's a very uh, common thread that a lot of us, especially now, look at our world that everything we're, we're seeing in society to look outside of ourselves. Right? It, it's yeah. acceptable in society. We're taught it. And that benefit of technology coming from a computer, our phone, teaches us to reach outside and go, oh, I need to know this. Let me look here. I need to understand why I'm feeling this way. Let me look here versus let me get quiet and go within. Mm. So the practices you named are, are perfect. But at that point in my life when I was looking outside and confused and sad and didn't understand why I was having visions and thoughts of bigger things and wanting to know more, when my first practices I don't think I was not meditating in my early 20s. It it took a while after college that I really started to embrace meditation. I definitely was always outdoors. So I was, I was hiking or horseback riding by myself. And in that by myselfness, I would listen. I'd go camping by myself. And really what I didn't know at the time was I was cultivating a sacred space to listen in nature. So for me, that was one of my first steps. When I started to then go to a a place to study, I started to read everything I could. I mean, reading became and still is my go-to. You know, I've stacked uh, brilliant books next to me every day to know that I was being fed real beautiful content that is, you know, whether it's hundreds of years old or 10 days old of beautiful authors and and leaders that were speaking and writing things that I could saturate and that would help me understand more because then I'm still in that reading of that practice. I'm taking in rich content. And then in that, then if I would be hiking, I'm kind of thinking about that content and thinking where does it fit in my life and what's possible now. So that every practice, and those were two little ones, interrupts the chatter of our brain that looks outside of ourselves to be filled up. 
every practice gets us back to center. So when I describe a spiritual practice now to my clients and when I'm speaking, you know, it's spiritual practices, whatever you want to name, that brings you back to center, to that core within where you're connected to source. So now my practices are prayer, meditation, visioning, intention work daily, journaling, writing, reading, air, practice, practice, practice. I really believe we practice in our life until we live our practice because that's what we're here to do. And with every and, practice, we become more centered. And it's ongoing work. <laughs> daily, really? now, daily. After, after, you, you don't do it a lot and then stop and say, I'm done. It's just, it's just never ends. At your, at your website, you share that you were always a doer. And I can tell you this is something that I've struggled with. And I, 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 my grandparents, I rarely saw them sit down. But they, like working two mm-hmm. jobs. Every, all me and my siblings all have worked two jobs at the same time. Just this constant going, working two jobs, going to college, just yep. work, 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 work. So I saw that all of, all around me and just, just being a do- doer. So when I read it such a website, I know you shared that you were always a doer. And people saw mm-hmm. you as cheerful and energetic. Yeah, you said deep down you felt insecure and af- afraid, and nobody thinks of a doer that way. Uh, mm-hmm. What did you do to marry your inner and outer world uh, so that you felt more loved, safe, and ready to bloom? Hey, when you're talking about your spiritual practices, it sounds so easy, but really, how did you get mm. him from that point of pain to, mm-hmm. was there something like magical or mystical that happened to you? How did you make that shift? It truly, truly, truly was a commitment to practice, even through the tears. So even while I'm crying and hurting and thinking, okay, okay, what what am I supposed to do next? I would still practice something that brought me back. It is, I, I sure don't mean to make it sound easy because it's so much part of my life now. I'm, I'm the first one to say this isn't easy work, but it's worth it. And pretty soon when you, it's, it's like this, Denise, I look at it this way. When I am talking to a group and I'll say, everyone knows, is there any, are there any professional athletes in the room? Because professional athletes go to their practice on an automatic. And did it happen to them that way initially? No. They built that practice. But when the mindset switches to, I wake up and I begin my practice because this is the sport or whatever activity that I am to aim to be brilliant at, there isn't a question that they say, oh, I think I'll take today off. I know I've got that big, you know, game tomorrow, but I'm just going to take today off. They just do it. When we yeah. look at our own mind of, wow, my spiritual practices are just, are even more important than that because they bring me back to center. And when I'm centered, I can listen to the inner voice within about which path to go. And then when I go down the wrong path, it's being really, I mean, a big spiritual practice is being gentle. To, through the tears, through the sadness to say, oh, my gosh, I'm, I didn't go down the right path here. Let me gently love myself to listen. What do I know now? Because even in what looks like a mistake for our lives, there's always a pearl of wisdom in it. If we, As we learn to move through it, we get to love ourselves through every tear, through every pain, through every celebration. But the act of loving ourselves with a kindness and standing in acceptance for ourselves is, the, to me, the path of, to, of healing on the planet. Because once we stand in acceptance of ourselves, we start to be more accepting of others. Mm-hmm. So that in itself is a practice. Can I be gentle as I forgot to do my practice today? Uh, people come in and say, oh, my gosh, I can meditate for the last four days. I just, this happened in my life and that. And I look at them and say, so take a deep breath, forgive yourself, and just begin again today. If you have five okay. minutes to sit in that chair or go sit under the tree, celebrate that instead of I didn't do it. You know, you're doing this. I, I love that you just asked about that and talked about that because I was raised in the same family. How many jobs can we work? How fast can we move? Because <laughs> that, right, that's, that's where I learned I based my self-worth. It took years for me to get, oh, I have based my self-worth on how much I do. And right. what, then that created a, a spinning person who I was just spinning till I fell. And that was not coming from a place of center. That was looking outside of myself. Well, we'll everyone see how much I do. So mm. I, I'm worthy. And yeah. when we remember, you know, there's now in life, I'll say, if we take our being, our state of being, 
and, and this is why I think B comes before D in the alphabet. Like our being, move our being into our doingness. Then we're conscious, awake individuals making a difference on the planet. When we just do to move fast to do, then we're just really good doers, but there's a bit of spinning and not being centered in it. If you come from sitting on your meditation pillow or just saying a prayer before you walk into a big business meeting or starting a, a, you know, your company meeting with an intention, that's going back to your practice. That's a beingness, state of being. And then you move into doing your productivity in companies and your joy in families. Everything's going to shift to an awakened practice instead of just doing it because you got to do it. Yes, you know what, and and it, it's it it is a bit of it's it's a kind of a tightrope in the world because there is an outer world mm-hmm. and it's got a strong strong pull and so many things come up. I mean, I stopped watching the news when I was a kid because there's there's so much pull you can get caught and pulled in so many different yes. directions. What, 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 yes. So you don't then you don't take the time to do the inner, or you're doing both, but there's still that. Outer pulling is so strong that somebody else is very emotional about something. Next thing you know, you get hyped up about it. So it, it is you right. have to stay stay centered. But that shared, I wanted to ask you, and I love the title. What what inspires you, Kim? Why did you sit down to write this specific book, The Technology mm-hmm. of Intention? I had been practicing intention as is practice since, you know, early on. And I was led to brilliant teachers who assisted me to keep growing and being awake and individual and building my practice. One of the, when I got my license to be a licensed practitioner and started working with people, my intention practice was already strong and I started to assist others with it. And I began to see not only was my life had changed so dramatically, by consciously using this tool, because living a life of intention is one of the most powerful practices to create our lives consciously. When I started to see all my clients and families and friends who were using the same power of intention and their lives would change, but they'd come back and they'd look at me and say, could you write me an intention for this? And what's an intention for that? And I realized, wait a second, I would love, I would, I will forever want to assist you on that. And I want you to do it. So let me, and they'd ask me, well, what are the steps to it? And it was really birthed from how can I get this information out? And this is my view of it. And if it helps someone that excites me and I'm grateful. And so it's really, here's another path to use intention and see if it works. And it was from that joy where the book was birthed. And that was really, you know, when I sat in meditation one day and spirit was like, start writing, start writing now. And in my head, I was like, when do I have time to do that? And it was, see, back to the doing. And it kept coming out for me, like, just put it down, just put it in paper, put it in paper. And when that inner voice got louder, I realized, oh, it's not me writing. (laughs) I just get to say yes. And once I surrendered to, okay, yes, then when I open my computer and start writing, I don't, I don't do that until I first be and I sit quietly, have a little ceremony, light a candle, get quiet, set my intention, which is my intention is to be an open vessel of, of you know, spiritual information that is coming through me, that is not mine, but it's coming through me, and I'm open for it to be divinely articulated in this writing session. And then I begin. Then all of a sudden it started to absolutely flow through me. So my fingers would just keep going. And through my willingness to sit still, the book was birthed. And I, I find it very interesting, Denise, that in that it was, I'd been working on it for a while and life would get busy. And then um, I'm not sure if you know, but a couple of years ago when it was, I still had a chunk to write that then I experienced, I was in the Southern California fires and I lost my home and my office and retreat center in one night. And the only thing that made it out the door in the middle of the night was my dogs and my computer. And that following year was extremely intense. Nowhere to live. And everything we ever had in our life was gone. And that year that book got finished. That made no sense to me to, in, on a logical place. In my logical mind was like, how could one of the hardest years of my life 
this book got done and birthed. And what I share about that is that's the power of intention. The the universal field that was helping me write this book did was not stopped because the house burned down. This book, the intention was set. The intention was set years ago. My intention is to be open to birth this book in the divine timing and that it comes through me with ease and grace. That intention was set years ago, and it was not going to be stopped because the house burned down. It still got written. didn't matter whose house I was in at any given time. Those, it still was turned into the publisher and birthed on one of the hardest years of my life. That's the power of intention. Wow. So, so Kim, and, and kudos to you mm-hmm. for keep for continuing to keep going. I mean, kudos to you and your family. Mm. Uh, can you tell us the difference between when you say an intention? What's the difference between an intention and a wish, mm-hmm. a hope, mm, and a beautiful. dream? Because we can dream and dream, daydream, night dream, and sure. nothing come from it. So, what's the difference between an intention, a wish, a hope, and a dream? So, a wish is something, and like our hearts pull oh, I wish this would happen, right? And I'm not sure if it's landing that it's going to happen, but it's a wish, and wishes are beautiful. All of these are beautiful. Dreams, or we could dream about something, and no, I see it, I'm dreaming about it. And we get to, we must, I don't want to say must, I'm really careful and aware of my words. We have an opportunity to propel the wish, the hope, and the dream into motion by activating the field of intention. So the wish, the hope, and the dream are beautiful, and they're visions, and they're pulling at our hearts, correct? But we want to get it moving forward. So you take your wish, hope, and dreams, and then you line up with the power of intention, which is a lasered statement supporting the wish, hope, and the dream. So I ask people, if this is your wish to say, create a a home for my family say that's someone's wish i want my home to look like this kim but i don't know how i'm going to do it and i don't even have the money for it yet but these are my wishes and my hopes and my dreams i would ask them tell me about that house what does it feel like what does it look like so they're really seeping in the wish and hope and the dream and when they give me the qualities of what they're wishing hoping and dreaming about then what i do is listen to let's write a really clear intention about that that my intention is to call forth and accept a beautiful home that's filled with light and room for my children and is right in the financial alignment with all that I can exchange and the law of circulation and call this house forward with ease and grace and I know that I'm being pulled towards it as it is coming to me. Something like that. That, that sounds good, Kim. Yeah. I'm listening to you. <laughs> I go, okay, let's go. <laughs> right? And so, and so if that is the intention, you see the difference? Wish, hope, and dream, we were looking at it. The intention, uh, it is written down. I'm putting it right there in front of me. And every day when I look at that, now the universe knows we're calling forth that house. Our job is to not get stuck in the how ever. The how is not. Uh, it, it, we're, we're to release that. We're to let it go. Because spirit has every way to create in unimaginable ways when we let go. What our job is is to listen, back to the deep listening, to the guidance. doesn't mean we don't do anything. We listen to the inspired action, not just doing to do. We listen to, oh, to follow that. All of a sudden we may be guided to make a phone call to this person. We may be driving down the road and go, whoa, look at that house. Let's pull over and talk to them. Like we have inspired action, but not reactionary action out of fear. There's a difference. Intentions keep you grounded, centered, and, and you aim for what you're looking towards. You're wishing, you're hoping, you're dream, but you give it fuel by writing an intention and then following the steps that it would take to fulfill that and letting go of the how, because then you're open for the miracles. Wow. You know what? This is something that how many people have told me you hear they wish they would really like to do what you're saying. And this is a, a friend of mine, from a, she's from another country, but she said in a country where she's from, some people practice, practice like black arts. And I said, well, why would people do that? She said they want stuff now. Then you you don't want to work mm-hmm. through it. You want to get it like right now. If there's a, if it, and mm-hmm. we we see that in our society where we don't want to wait for stuff. 
People want things right now, and if they don't get it right now, they just abandon it. So here's a here's a question. If something takes, let's say you set an intention and it takes you 10, 20 years to get it, and I mean 10, 20 mm-hmm. years of hard work to get it, Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, Colonel Sanders just popped into my head. How many years he had to keep trying to figure out? He knew he had a good recipe, and he he said he just couldn't figure out how to. He filed bankruptcies, he had divorces, his wives left. Mm-hmm. He, he still just knew this was a good recipe, and he, it took yes. him decades, decades to figure it out. Mm-hmm. So if it, if it takes you that long. And you you like oh my god somebody somebody's like I'm divorcing you you just you can't get it together and you're going through all this uh, uh, similar like when you you lost your home and you you still uh, mm-hmm. wrote and published the technology of intention how do you not get zoned in on the how when is when you when you mm-hmm. are working so hard and you're like nothing's working how do you not start yes. to get zoned in on the how and start to start to doubt that it will even happen. That is where you dive deeper in your practice. And I'm mm. not kidding you when I say I could, we, through, through our tears, through the frustration, through the doubt, we still show up and practice. And mm. in our world, because things come so fast to us, we've earned a society that we, our mindset is, I want it now, I want it now, I want it now, versus let me cultivate the consciousness that can hold that when it arrives. <laughs> because when that what we want arrives, then you're living on a whole new vibration because then you've got to, oh, let me say that aware, we have the opportunity to really live what it takes for what you just wished for. Because one has to expand their consciousness to now live in that field of what they wished for. And if we could shift our perception to, What is being cultivated in me while it looks like that has not come yet? Maybe what's being cultivated is patience. Maybe what's being cultivated is faith. Maybe what's being cultivated is really discernment and clarity. We as a society, as humanity, get to come back to qualities that are life-expanding, not just about getting. And, and, And the getting seems like it's speed because... It looks like we could have things fast, which we can. And what happens with the cultivation of a consciousness that wants to uh, call forth all that they desire? That means that the how gets to be looked at, reviewed, and think, okay, what must I grow in now? Because it hasn't happened yet. You know, in the example about the house and the fire, the first year after that fire, I moved seven times into different people's houses because I had no place to live. And where to see clients? My office burned down. And where to do large retreats? The whole retreat center's gone. The how was impossible for me to see. I couldn't see it. First, I was overwhelmed in grief and sadness and confusion. If I would have got stuck in the how, I would have missed the miracle. So when someone that I barely knew calls and says, I heard what happened to you. And I have, I'm going to not be in my house for the next month, and I'm offering it to you. Someone I've wow. got to tell you. But now, see, if I would have been caught in the how, I would have been looking for, oh, where am I going to, oh, my gosh, where am I going to go? I need to find it now. I'm not saying that didn't exist, the fear inside of me. Please know, it, the feeling existed. The fear was there of wanting to look for the how. My practice, because I practiced for so many years, I could be crying and confused, and I still kept doing my best to come back to center and go, okay, what's my practice? Okay, I'm going for a walk. I'm crying the whole way I'm walking. I don't know where I'm going to do this next, but my practice is to say a prayer, to set my intention, to sit down on next to this tree and to cry it out and to journal. What is the practice that will cultivate the consciousness so I hear the answer when it comes through? Wow, man! I'm telling you, I'm gonna start using some of these tips you're sharing here today. We are talking about <laughs> Kim Stanwood, Tara Nova, the author of the book "The Technology of Intention." The technology of intention. Now, Kim, why do we hide our inner power and our inner pearls from ourselves? And even piggybacking on that, and I heard somebody raise this before: the brain, how we lie to ourselves. It's it's really odd. Sometimes we set ourselves up for the, for success. Sometimes our brains, routines, 
a, a, a psychotherapist said one of, the, one of the things you want to do is get your brain off of autopilot. You want to get it off because mm-hmm. you'll miss, like you said, the miracles. You'll miss seeing that stuff because you're, you're so mm-hmm. on autopilot that you just, you, mm-hmm. you're missing a lot of, of information. You're so yes. caught into routine, routines and patterns. Why do we do that and why do we hide our own inner power and our inner pearls from ourselves? The very thing we're looking for. Yes. So it, there's so many answers to that. And I, it, what comes up for me immediately is, and I, I preface it, is up until now in society, it hasn't always been supported for us to really shine our, our, our wisdom. In other words, when I was growing up, if I wanted to say, hey, I think this or that, very often someone would go, who do you think you are? You don't know that. What are you talking about? And so I, and then I dim my light, like, oh, my gosh, you can't be that bright. I can't, I can't act like I know because then that could be ego versus when we really start to trust who we are, it's, that's an act of self-love that is scary because in the world, you know, it's it's shifting. I know it's shifting. That we're beginning as a, as a you know conscious humanity to help each other rise, like to instead of judging one another when one's growing, that if we can open our hearts to each other and say, yes, keep growing, shine, tell me those pearls. How do I do that? And when we know we're one body of consciousness, all of humanity, instead of oh, it's me against you, that there isn't an yeah. against. There's a with. Then we create, it's, I believe, our growing edge in the world to create safety to support each other shining. Because as we support each other shining, and I, I thank you for saying, inviting me to be here today, because we get to be here and have these conversations to help each other to know more. It's like when you said at the beginning, you know more and learn more with every guest. And I was saying in the guest, and w- as a guest, I get to learn more being in your presence. Then we create, <clears throat> excuse me, safety to rise. And in the safety, we could share our pearls when we create safety for one another to do so. And we first have to create it for ourselves. <clears throat> but every intention and then every acknowledgement and every celebration creates a field of, oh, it's safe for me to grow. We get to create safety for each other to grow. Also, so we're t- we're talking with Kim for the po- the technology of intention. I want to ask you next. I had never heard of this before. Uh, and this from the technology of intention. What are the three power pillars? The three power pillars are a way that um, I was able to articulate for others to be able to write intentions easily. I, I noticed there was a theme to when intentions come through me and there were these three three elements and intentions that are really powerful so if we look at it in this framework we're able to write intentions and stay out of expectations so the first one is that intentions are 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 statement a written statement but they're always in the positive so our languaging gets to be very positive. We don't put the word not. I'm not going to eat that chocolate cake is an intention that would still take you into the not versus my intention is to eat um, things that honor my body. That would be in, is they're always written in the present moment. We don't write an intention that says, my intention is that tomorrow I'm going to do great in that board meeting because the power is in the present moment. We can only breathe this breath in this moment. We can't breathe tomorrow's yet. We can only breathe this one. So when we have our intentions in the present moment, we're activating that spiritual wisdom within us in this moment. So first one was positive. Second one's in the present moment. The third pillar takes a little bit um, to embody at times. But what it is is that they're written based on qualities not outcomes. So the difference here is oh. like a goal is written. A goal is written is on a specific outcome. And nothing is wrong with that. Intentions, we may aim for that outcome, but we write them in the qualities of what will be fulfilled in it. Because if we need to let go of the how and we're allowing the universe to help us, a certain outcome may be a limitation. What if the universe wants to bring us even more than that? See, so if 
if the outcome could unconsciously limit the intention if we name it. So say the qualities would be, let me go back to that house when someone wanted a house, and I asked them, what are the qualities that you're wanting in that home? Open availability, safety for my family, room for my children, all those are what we put in lace. We lace our intention with that. My intention is to call for the house of safety and plenty of room for my family and divine financial exchange. Those are all qualities. We don't say, my intention is to have that house, 172 Jones Road. In this, because right there, what if 175 of Mary Beth Road around the corner had everything you wanted, but you never even saw it because you were only viewing that. That would be controlling the how and so you're not open for the miracle whereas when intentions are just based in qualities you could you you could embody those qualities and spirit co-creates with you to bring you all that you desire doesn't mean you don't if someone has to say you know the house or a relationship i'd say to someone tell me about the relationship you want to call for it loving honest integrity and a partner that walks with me side by side to create in life. doesn't say it's a guy or the girl down the street that looks like this. You know, it says this is the quality of a relationship I want. You know, that's very interesting. I would imagine that well, from your experience, you, you work with clients. Do you find that most of us already have, like if it's a relationship, we already have somebody picked out? <laughs> we already have, like when you said the house, the 172, the street, we already have what we want picked out. And from your experience working with clients, do you, do you, do you or do you not find that happens a lot? And does that begin, get in the way of us fulfilling that intention? Yes, it does happen a lot. And I meet people right in the middle because sometimes when people first begin working with intentions, they'll say, but Kim, I want that, that. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'll say, okay, so how about this? How about if tell me about the that, so say it's the relationship and, and the qualities of it, and if, they're, if they really feel like it's just with this being, then I'll say, okay, I'm, I'm hearing you, but that is a limitation. You're putting it right there. And to honor where they're at, I'll say the intention gets to say my intention is to call forth all these qualities except the divine relationship with this, you know, being that I'm aiming for or someone I haven't even met yet. Like you have to open it at the end of the intention of, or something more. This isn't it. This is all I can see right now. But or something more for my highest good. If it's a home, that house in 172 Jones Street or something else of this vibration that, that matches all that I desire so that if I'm going to meet them in the middle until they can start to really trust themselves in the universe because that's when they won't name the exact outcome. Back to that house for me, trying to find a place to live, right? I didn't know and I just knew my my intention at that time in my life was to call for a place for my family to create space as a safe home while our home, while we discover if our home is going to be rebuilt or what we're going to do. So then those seven times of moving were from different people that I like I said, didn't know at times that would say, here, we'd like to offer you this. I could, I didn't even know they existed. But if I was only riveted on it, it has to be that. I just limited spirit. See, our humanness in saying, it's got to be that. It's got to be that. We just limit yeah. it. Well, and I, I want to be clear on this. We don't limit spirit. We limit what we accept from spirit. Uh. Spirit's unlimited. And Spirit will be like, oh, I had a house three times that size right down the street ready for you, but you were only ready to on this one. <laughs> and the one I was had for you was free, and you didn't even see it because you were thinking wow. it was this one. But that wow. requires trust. I'm not, I'm not saying this, that that happens easily. This requires a practice of, you know, it took, it took time for me to cultivate the consciousness to know, okay, I'm going to trust because I'm going to keep setting my intentions. And then I'm going to celebrate when they're fulfilled, and, and I'm going to do it again and celebrate when it's fulfilled. So I built a trust, and we all get to do it, to build the trust within us, to trust ourselves, to trust source, and then 
start aiming that our intentions are really about the qualities and what we desire, and we truly let go of them so that the how comes to us. We don't have to determine it. We get to discern and listen for it. Well, you know, you talk with such conviction. I can tell you've had a lot of experiences <laughs> with this. Would it tell us here at Off the Shelf some, a few of the other topics that you cover in the book for for listeners who may be just on the verge of, 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 of purchasing the book or somebody listening live now or in the future. Off mm. the Shelf airs on so many different platforms. Thank you. But uh, can you tell us some of the other topics that you cover in the technology of Absolutely. Absolutely. I, there's a, a whole chapter about releasing expectation and living a life of intention. And it's a very important chapter because we unconsciously have expectations everywhere and our expectations tend to lead to disappointment. And when we can really see, whoa, to stop living in expectation, all I have to do is start setting clear intentions. Then we can, we have a tool that's right at our fingertips to know, you know, an expectation can be, oh, I, everything's going to be great at work today. If, if just that certain person shows up and brings me that document I want, that could be an expectation <laughs> that could lead someone down the path of disappointment all day. So that chapter really shows how when we catch ourselves in expectation, we could take a breath and go, wait, let me just set an intention. My intention is to be present at work and call forth, you know, abundance and success in all my meetings. Then we stay out of expectation. That's a very important mm-hmm. chapter. And then um, there's a whole chapter on practices. So I really give examples of here's some practices. Try this one. See how that fits for you, whether it's journaling, whether it is grounding with the earth. Like try different practices. And then I have a chapter of tons of examples of intentions because they do come through me. I just gave tons of like, here's a whole bunch of intentions on finances, lots of intentions on relationships. Someone, someone could open the book and think, I need an intention today, and I can't think of one. What is it? And it's right there. So that that way, until the practice is strong for readers, that they have them in front of them. Um, and then the close to the end chapter is important as well about acknowledgement and celebration and gratitude and how the importance of really living an appreciation of life because that cultivates a field for more good to land on you. When you're really appreciating the highs, the lows, you know, my spiritual teacher said to me, he said, when he said, when you're grateful for even the challenges, you're evolving because you know, in that challenge, something must grow in you to assist you in life. And that's a, that's where we get to keep aiming for. I'm going to be grateful for all of it, the hard stuff and the good stuff. You know, that was one thing that you just brought up when you said the challenges. When I think like the technology of intention and everything you're sharing, and thanks for what you're sharing here on Off the Shelf, I, always, I, I, I don't know why I do this. I always think if I do it right, it will all only be good. And that if mm. anything challenging happens, then that means I did something wrong. But you're saying a, yeah. a part of it, a part of the, the challenges do come. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong, it's just, a, I guess, a part of living in this world. I always think if yes. you're also right, it just, it's always good. It's just peace and joy and love and everything, just clarity. And then if it gets confused, yeah. it's challenging, I think, oh, I must, I did something wrong. I made a, I did something wrong. I had a misstep somewhere. That's what I always think. And I think, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I think that's our human, we get to evolve as beings to know that we do do that. I do it as well. Like, oh, we go straight to what did I do wrong or what did someone else do wrong? And when we could come back to, we just get to ask a different question. And that's the spiritual practice in itself is asking empowering questions. Like what is growing in me right here? What must grow in me? What quality for me to get through this challenge? Then we activate possibility instead of victim mentality. You know, we activate the place of, okay, I'm going to pull myself out of thinking I'm wrong and look at what am I to learn? Well, just imagine if we taught our youth as, as they fall, and so, you know, because that's when we're really growing. And we look at our youth and say, what do, you get, what do you get to master now? What do you get to know now as you grow through this next challenge? What, what within you gets to be you know, grown? Is it your strength? Is it your love for yourself? Is it to believe in yourself? 
so that we could keep growing together. Um, but every challenge has a pearl in it. Really, if we all look back on the challenges we've had, if we focused our attention on who we became to get out of it and get here, did we become stronger? Were we wiser in that very difficult divorce? When someone we loved less, our, did we become more trusting or more of ourselves to know we can move through things? Did we become more loving to others? Did we become more compassionate? What are the areas that we grew in ourselves because that challenge went down? Then we start to get off our back, right, and really, really be gentle with ourselves to know challenges are going to come. That's, this is a human experience. And in the human experience, if we view challenges, that's my growing edge. And I'm, I'm walking towards it because I want to grow. What are some signs, uh, as we come down to the last 10 minutes of today's show, what are some signs mm-hmm. that, that we might be experiencing some intentional deficit disorder or that we could, we could <laughs> really have an a opportunity to, to ha- have more, live more intentional? Signs that where um, there's a deficit in it is when we continue to look outside and expect the world to do something, give us something, or another human to do something or give us something, right? Then we're not, we're mm-hmm. looking outward for things from others. And that's when we get stuck and we're, we forget we are all co-creating our reality. So the second you catch expectation in your life, disappointment, judgment, resentment, those, those states are definitely signs of, there's an opportunity to take a breath and think, oh, wow, what intention can I set here? What intention can I set now? Now, just that question will already bring you back to center. You know, and I used to ask that question, and I still do to my children, every day before they got out of the car to go off into school, I'd say to them, hey, what's your intention today? Hey, what's your intention? As they're getting out of the car to go to college. My intention was to assist them to stay present that they were co-creating their life instead of being an expectation and looking towards either somebody else to do something for them. So our signs are when we look outside and get caught up in all those feelings that I can't do it, I'm not good enough, they're not good enough, look what was done to me. We can, those things that are happened to us, doesn't mean we ignore them, doesn't mean they didn't go down doesn't mean we didn't get hurt by someone, but if we stay stuck in that, we are losing the opportunity to co-create our lives through that, which would get us out of the pain. So any of those signs, if we could gently love ourselves and know, oh, I, I'm stuck for a minute. You know, I'm, I went through something this week that I was stuck for a moment, and those were the words I used. I went, I'm just stuck. I'm forgetting who I am. I've got to get What's the practice? And I went straight to the mountains and went running into the mountains. Like, let me just remember who I am. It's okay, Kim. Come back. Come back to yourself. What's going on? And that assisted me to come back to center to then say, okay, what's my intention today? To be present, you know, when I, to be available. When I think, of, when I think about the, all the addictions from food addictions to work, to, mm-hmm. uh, it's just, the list goes on and on and on. It's like what the, mm-hmm. the, the work you do really is needed. Mm-hmm. It's really it's it's mm-hmm. really needed and I'm I'm thinking of his name. He's since transitioned. Uh, Wayne Dyer. He was one Marty I knew Lapko you were gonna was say a, Wayne Dyer. Marty Lapko was another one. They did this work. They did this work. I mean there are others who do it as well. But we need more of it because you see with our addictions we are reaching out. We're reaching yeah. out for yes. food a, a liquor, we're reaching out with cigarettes, we're reaching outside of ourselves for something yes. quick that'll, that'll help us to shift. We, we, we want to do it. We want to do the good work. We just, we, we, we're not reaching in, we're reaching out. All that said, Kim, we, said. as we come to the end of today's show, what mm-hmm. happens for those who might be wanting to join you in the future, what happens during a, a Namaste retreat? Oh, my goodness. It's like this on steroids. 
<laughs> Meaning that, that we, at a retreat, you know, some I have one-day retreats, three-day retreats, longer retreats, we really do deep work of inner healing. So we go through, of course, we talk about intentions, but every retreat has a theme, and it's all aimed on healing and getting us back to our center to be awake and in conscious individuals on this planet. So sometimes... You know, there's lots of processes that are healing and may bring up tears, and there's lots that are fun and adventurous. The aim is always for me to assist others to know themselves more fully and really embody a life of practices that honor them. So it's not for me to name someone's practices. My intention is to bring a batch of tools and say, let's practice, let's practice together and find out what is the one that's going to help heal you Stay centered in a world that's very reactionary, that you could be a calm, responsive, awakened individual and create the life you want to create. So they're extremely empowering and, and, and assisting people to be awake. Yeah, you know, and I think, again, it's so, it's so needed. A lot of motivational uh, speakings that I hear, it's, they're very, very goal-centered. What the, the message that you have is, is different. And Wayne Dyer always said it was, it's, he said uh, reaching a goal he thought was easy. He, he sort mm-hmm. of spoke a little bit like you did, that there's a deeper work for us to do. You can, you can reach a yeah. goal or hit a target, but there's a deeper work for us to do. Now, you received your training in spiritual studies, and again, we're coming down to the last few minutes, from the mm-hmm. Agape International Spiritual Retreat. For our listeners who are very serious, about this path. I, I know it's a path I've been on for a long time, but would you advise someone yes. interested in offering trainings or services similar to yours to undergo a training or is just doing their own spiritual oh, yes. practices enough? Yes. Yes and yes and yes. I, I, I believe that every path of learning, I'm gonna, I will be taking classes forever as well as teaching classes forever because I'm an eternal student and agape I've been at for in my entire adult life because Michael Bernard Beckwith is a brilliant spiritual teacher and has assisted me profoundly. And so there is one, I teach there at the Agape University as well as my own work through my own company so that wherever someone is pulled to grow, you know, there's beautiful teachers in the world to assist us. And, and at any moment that it pulls at one's heartstring to say, oh, I want to learn with that being, then go do it. Because we learn in all different ways, and it's, it's through others and talking and growing and healing at retreats and workshops and online as well as doing our own inner reading. But definitely to stay engaged in your growing edge. I, and as I said, I will be growing forever. I want to be. I don't ever want to stop because we are evolving beings. We didn't come here we, to know just so much. We came here to grow and to grow together. Can you tell us about the name of your company or companies and any other services that you offer we haven't covered as we close out today's show? You've covered so much. I thank you. So, of course, <laughs> at Kim Stanwood Terranova, my website would lead you to all my social media pages where I'm always bringing forth um, the retreats I'm teaching, where I'm speaking at any certain point so that I could see different people. I'm also teaching at Rhythmia Life Advancement Center in Costa Rica. So there's so any of those areas. And, of course, purchase the book. I would, I would love to meet anyone in person at the perfect moment to come and say, hey, we were, we were tuning in to the show and we were right here together. Wow. Where can off-the-shelf listeners get a copy of The Technology of Intention? Where can they get a copy? And is um, it available Amazon, in you go, e-book, yep, paper, it's on, audio it's book? It's on Amazon. It's all of those. And my audio book should be out in the next week. I recorded it a few weeks ago, so it's definitely um, available all over Amazon as well as you could get it at Agape, um, all different, or you could go to, like I said, to my website, whatever works, but the technology of intention can be downloaded to you today. Lots of times when I'm teaching in Costa Rica, someone will raise their hand and say, just ordered your book. It's sitting in my it's sitting on the porch in Bronx, and I'll be there tomorrow. And I'm like, great. I love that. <laughs> That's where technology is serving us as well. When we need things fast, and then we get to slow down and go in and really cultivate what was just delivered. And that's our own practice. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Oh, Kim, you've been a blessing, and this hour just blew by. It went so fast. We have been honored, you all. For those of you who came in 
maybe midstream or later in the show. But I say no worries when it finishes your streaming. You can listen to it in its entirety and share it, share it, share it, share it. And we have just been blessed to have with us Kim Stanwood, Terra Nova. Her website is, is spelled just the way it sounds, K-I-M-S-T-A-N-W-O-O-D. T E R R A N O B A dot com, Ken Stanwood, Terranova.com, and she is the author of the book, The Technology of Intention. Oh my goodness, you guys, go back and listen to the show in its entirety. Get the book because, I, you know, we, are, we, we come through where people talk to motivational speakers about goal setting and goals and the power of intention she takes it. That is just so much more and, and involving. Mm. Thank you for what you shared here, Kim. So appreciate you. you. And, I'm honored. Oh, and, and as I tell all of our listeners, you are so incredible. You are awesome. You are amazing. Go out and create a fabulous day for yourself. See you back here next Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Kim, I'll shoot you an email when the show finishes streaming. Perfect. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye for now. Have a blessed day. Bye.